Welcome back, everyone. And we have Wano Sam back with us as well, I hope. And um, so that was a very fascinating conversation. And I think it'll only get better in the last part uh, with all the questions flooding in from the audience. And um, thank you for those of us who are still stay, staying with us after two hours, very intensive intellectual conversation. Thank you for your enthusiasm. So before we dive into the, the questions from the audience, uh, we'd like to have two more polling questions um, or three. Um, so can I have the first question, please? All right, this is only if you're comfortable answering, right? You can skip the question if you don't feel comfortable. How would you describe your current status in terms of relationship? If you're single, in a relationship, married, divorced, or it's complicated? <laughs> All right. Wow, we have a large, single, and fabulous audience. Great. Oh, so, dear Mr. Sturman. Can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, we have a pretty young audience. Um, single, 61%, 28 in a relationship. Only 6% of uh, whoever is online now is married. And 5% complicated. That's interesting. No one divorced. That's also interesting. <laughs> All right, can we have the next question, please? Yep, we, we talked before about the willingness to get married. So this is, I think, more for those who are still single, okay, um, or divorced. Um, and would you like to get married? This is only talking about willingness, right? Not talking about any practical realities. Hard to say, yes, I have the plan. No, I don't want to. I've got married already. Oh, okay, so and divorced. So let's see what's the intention of our single crowd. Hard to yeah. say. Now I really want to hear from those 44%. Okay, 15% already have the plan. 34% is absolutely no, I don't want to. That's very determined. And 7% are married already. Okay, thank you so much for sharing. I believe we have one more question. That's the last question. All right, so we discussed a lot about aging and regardless of your relationship status, whether you're single or married, are you worried about your future in an aging society, regardless of where you are, where you're coming from? Very worried, or it's manageable, you cannot handle, or you didn't think about it. All right, let's see what the answer is. All right, that's also interesting. 30% is very worried, and 40% is worried, but trust it'll be manageable. And there is 20% haven't thought about it. You might want to start thinking about it now, <laughs> after hearing this uh, event. All right, thank you so much for participating in this poll. It gave us a bit more idea and a sense of like where you are coming from. Um, so, all right, so we do have a lot of questions from the audience and we will not have time to answer all of them, but we'll be selecting some of them um, to see which ones are more representative. Um, all right, so we were just talking like before the break, we were just talking about like care work and the division among families. So we do have one question from Yue Tong. Um, how can we create a society where care work is valued as much as any other profession and caregivers are given proper financial and social support. I think that touches on both in terms of individual job for those caretakers and also as a system design. So just curious, um, to, shall we start with this question and then we'll get on, move on to other topics. I have a simple and clear answer. <laughs> Great. 
All right. Replacing your male politicians with female politicians. I mean, once you know that they experience what is care, they must value the I mean importance of care. I mean that men, especially male politicians, have never experienced uh, I mean caregiving, and uh, they forgot about you know their they themselves receiving care. So in this sense, you know that uh, it, this is quite the important question that how we can value the care. Uh, I mean the uh, women know the value of care. Depress them with the women. <laughs> Great, simple, straightforward answer. Thank you, I know so. Florian, do you have anything to add on this one? Yeah, maybe I can add from two aspects. One is the uh, time use statics. Uh, the state um, government uh, should um, do the time uh, use statistic when they do the census. So this can uh, reveal how women's unpaid uh, care work. Another is give policy uh, to um, mandatory parent leave, um, paternity leave. The father should take mandatory leave when a new baby born. Uh, so I just. Well, yep. can I add something, you know, that the, talking about the time use study, we did have a lot, but the, actually, you know, that the, even though, uh, I mean, women have uh, unpaid uh, work uh, yeah, at home, you know, as far as it's less valued, you know, time use doesn't uh, I mean, the, mean anything. And uh, so we call it, you, you know, we call this women's unpaid work as a private patriarchy. But once they go out of home and take a job of home help and others, they are much less paid, very poorly paid. We call it public patriarchy. Patriarchy works everywhere, well, inside and outside of the home. And uh, time doesn't matter. And uh, the other thing I know that uh, I agree with Fen Yuan that uh, it's quite important to invite men for caring. And uh, I mean, let them experience what is care. Yep, absolutely. So um, we have a lot of questions flooding in. And in terms of the caring, and that also kind of brings us to the topic of broader family division of labor, um, and how do we structure the, the care work within the family, right? So, and also touches on the low fertility rate issue. And we do have two questions um, around, you know, the question about whether or not to have children. And I'd like to actually read the, the full question from um, Jia Qi Liu. I think that's quite representative. Um, she is a 28 year old independent woman that's her emphasis, independent woman in Beijing and the only child in the family. And she can sense her mother's anxiety about her marriage. Absolutely. I don't want to settle, settle for a relationship that only aims for marriage and raising children. How can I explain my thoughts to my mom and relieve her anxiety? And which is also related to her own elderly care issue. So now the generation issue also comes in. So that's one, um, stay the thought with that one. And a very related one is um, how to deal with this intergenerational conflict over having children in China, especially if the older generation sometimes also have the economic power and may use their financial support to force their children into having grandchildren. So that's a question from Fan Yang. So we have two questions, both touch on this intergenerational dynamics, I wouldn't say that conflict. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? And how would you have uh, suggestions for these young women? Okay, this time, when you are you first. Oh, thank you. Uh, I think um, there are actually, there are many, so many different ways. Uh, you know, Chinese people celebrate Lunar New Year. So every Lunar New Year, that means family reunion, but also that means some uh, 
how they struggle uh, with this kind of dialogue. So this year, I noted in the social media as some um, like a samples for dialogue, how you can fight back or um, response to these questions. So there are many different ways, some with humor, some with um, very decisive manner. Um, to me, I think um, you need to understand help your parents understand who lives your life, especially for the younger generation. Um, so I, I think I cannot give a ready answer. So I think, yeah, thank you. Over to you, Wayne also. I'll give my turn. I mean, to the first question, uh, I mean, uh, from a girl, uh, from a independent woman aged 20, and uh, you know, as you see, I'm single, and uh, uh, I I I'm Ohitoisam for long years, and uh, I mean the main hope, a uh, main expectation of your parents is to see uh, their daughter, I mean, living happily. I mean, show them. I mean, even though you are single, uh, you are not lonely. You are not. I mean, isolated as myself, you know, that uh, I'm a single woman, but uh, I'm not lonely. I'm not isolated. I have uh, lots of friends and uh, colleagues and uh, living happily and show them you are living happy and no worry about you. <laughs> this is what you, you should do for your parents. <laughs> and uh, talking about the, uh, the second question, Intergenerational mutual help is very much important in uh, the society of uh, feminism, like in uh, East Asia. But uh, this kind of intergenerational, uh, I mean, uh, exchange uh, keeps, you know, both parents and uh, children in the very small, limited circle uh, to be interdependent so in this sense you know that uh, at some moment you know the uh, parents should leave their children free and also the children should get out of their parents protection and uh, I'm always thinking keep thinking that uh, you know that the, the the goal of parenthood is to make their children say at some moment of the life, I don't need you anymore. So this is a success. Uh, is it, this is a successful goal of the child rearing, I think. Yeah, thank you. Um, I caught like two quotes from both of you. I don't need you anymore, and who lives your life? And I think that's great suggestions mm -hmm. for, the, for the younger generation. And um, so we do have a um, couple of quest other questions around the fertility intention or willingness to give in birth. Um, one is around, can social media use affect women's fertility intention? So I think I'm curious actually here both in Japan and in China, like do you observe social media have an impact um, peer pressure in, in positive or, or negative ways will affect anyone's willingness. Um, and in some cases, another question is around not within the family pressure, but from the government and societal pushes for women to actually have children and get married. Um, how to push back and how to respond to those pressures. Any thoughts? Well, two questions are totally different. And for the first question about the social media, I mean, internet communication is much more advanced in China than in Japan. So maybe Feng Yuan uh, can answer this question. Mm -hmm. I will follow you later. Uh, yeah, uh, I think that yes, the social media, how say, can sub uh, enhance people with same similar uh, thought mm. so um, but still I don't think social media play a um, how to say decisive um, mm. or decisional uh, effect 
So I, th mm -hmm. I think still people's own values, ideas. Mm -hmm. so actually, important. I think you know that social media works both ways, positively and negatively, and of course, you know, it can be used as a, a tool of control. But at the same time, I think you know that the social media is very much, uh, I mean, costless, and so it can be a tool for, I mean, uh, poor people and also minority like us. And uh, so we, we can take advantage of this tool. I mean, uh, for uh, the elderly people and for the handicapped and the disabled. So it can work in both ways. And uh, the other thing is that, uh, well, the what was that, Joranda? Um, it's about how, like, we talked about the family pressure before, but there is also the government and societal push. Um, and we're seeing that emerging in China already because of the low fertility rate, right? So the question is about how, as an individual, how can you push back to that government and societal push for you to get married and have kids? So individuals... <laughs> yeah, but individual uh, as you see, you had the uh, one-child policy uplifted already. But so your government is now concerned about the fertility, but the people don't follow it. Right. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, I just add now the Tangping Life Flat is a popular word, but I think in um, in terms of this uh, to women, uh, I think uh, individual can have opportunities even in China. For example, recent years, uh, the government uh, decision makers, lawmakers, uh, will uh, solicit the public opinions, public contributions to a new law or to revise a new uh, revise a law. So this gives us an opportunity. For example, maybe Xiao Tong can show me a, a picture, maybe the last one. Uh, picture. Uh, for example, when China revised the law on protecting women, and last one, uh, uh, women's uh, protecting women's rights, last one. Uh, Yes, uh, last one. Yeah, this one. Um, so we have, we can see, we have uh, most people, made, most of them are women, to contribute to this law revision. Uh, after so many people's contribution, we can see some positive change. Uh, so I think, uh, but also it's relatively high, um, but we can say we have a, a huge women's population. Um, this then 10, um, 100,000, uh, uh, it's not a huge number. I think if we have uh, more women to speak out, to contribute to this kind of lawmaking or law revision, we can have, get more um, women friendly policy and laws. I will stop here. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Feng Yuan, for the additional information. Mm -hmm. And maybe one last question on the topic of fertility and having kids. Um, we, we talk a little bit on social media, so a couple of other questions around technology and um, the impact of uh, of digital technology and beyond and medical technologies for, for this particular topic. Um, so what do you think of the potential impacts and change of technology advancements such as AI, Web3, that's on the online space, but we also have artificial terrorists coming up and we have more and more advanced surrogacy. So what do you think of these technologies? What's the impact? Is that supporting and giving us more choice or that can be a new form of exploration? Over. Bueno, Sandra, do you want to go first? Okay, I'm quite suspicious about the development of uh, reproductive technology. It was first used by the uh, choice of, of uh, gender of the newborn uh, babies. And uh, also talking about the surrogacy, I mean, the it was always the women in the poor country who become surrogate mothers, and uh, they are, uh, it, it is always the men and women 
uh, in the wealthy country who is a customer. And uh, even the wealthy men, th there's actually one uh, example uh, in the United States, a Californian uh, man uh, in, uh, in his uh, old age, uh, who is very much wealthy, uh, I mean, become the, became a customer of surrogate mother living in India to be a father. The, the dream come true for man to be, a, I mean, a father, to be a parent without wives or without a woman. So it may be the ultimate dream of patriarchy. Hmm. That's very interesting. And Fran, do you have anything to yeah, add? Especially I, I, there is a growing trend mm. in China um, mm. uh, discussing about this as well. Yeah, I totally agree. Mm. Um, until women with uh, women's rights uh, awareness to make decision or to design this kind of technology, um, mm. uh, it won't happen for, yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, so you, you re reacted on the uh, on the uh, um, medical side. What about the like AI, Web3, um, the online technologies? Is there any thoughts? I know it's a very evolving new technology uh, at the moment. Talking about AI, so far it was already proven that the AI only learns the knowledge uh, what was already existing, you know, the status quo. And uh, it does not have a power to imagine <laughs> what would not what will not exist yet. And uh, so imagination and uh, creative power is uh, only uh, possible with humankind, not with AI. We don't have to be afraid of AI. Yeah, actually, um, there is an additional comment on, on the AI and technology in general about um, actually on the negative um, impact on technology in terms of uh, coded bias, the bias online within the existing data in the training data for AI that actually bias against women. Um, so just want to add that point as well. There is a, they may not lack, they may lack imagination, but it's already doing some harm. Yeah. Okay, let's move on to some other um, general feminism questions. Um, there is one simple, straightforward question about what to do, right? How to practice feminism in daily life? I know, Ueno san you, you wrote like many books about it, but <laughs> if you were going to summarize like in one minute, like what's the top one suggestion you would give on that one? Well, that's a very straightforward and a good question because, you know, feminism is everyday practice. It's, uh, not, it's not a matter of a big politics. So what you can do is to say no to whatever you feel uh, uncomfortable. And uh, what you can do is do whatever you like to do. You don't have to endure any unfairness imposed upon you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So do what you want to. Um, we have a couple of follow-up questions or related questions to that. And it'll make this question a little bit less straightforward. All right. So if a male feminist want to make a substantial contribution to gender equality, what suggestions, instructions, or examples should they follow? We're talking about male feminist here. More specifically, should. men should be feminist. Otherwise, right. they would have been or I mean sexist. So it's either a question: male feminist or male chauvinist. So male, mm -hmm. men, you know, feminism is a matter of gender relationship. So it, it's actually quite related to uh, men's being. So that they should be feminist. So what male feminists should do is to listen carefully to what do women say. Yep, listen carefully to what men say. 
<laughs> then you are, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. That's you can read my mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, if we have any male participants online uh, beyond the, that, we, whoever asked uh, what, the question. What do we, uh, what do we said so far with, uh, I mean, communication with men, I know. We spoke, I mean, we talk, we spoke, but we are not heard. That's a major question. The women not silenced. We spoke, we talked, but we are not heard. Mm -hmm. We should be listened. Yeah, absolutely. So listen carefully for those male online participants and tell your male friends as well. Um, and now the question even gets more interesting. So if you're a feminist and you want to talk to your non-feminist friend um, or anti-feminist, if there is such a word, about feminist topics, how do we construct such a conversation? That's also a question from the audience. That's also easy to answer because, you know, you don't have to talk about ideology, feminism as an ideology. You can just talk with her, I mean, about her own everyday life, how she feels, how she experiences, what kind of relationship she has with men and the society and the community. And there should be much in common as women's experiences. And uh, I mean, even anti-feminists uh, can feel uh, complaints and frustration with a male dominant society. And uh, I can easily sympathize with, even with the right-wing women. So feminism right. comes from the everyday life, you should remember. So that means, you know, that that comes from the, the, our slogan, personal is political. Absolutely. Personal is political. Thank you so much. All right. Now maybe let's move on to a little bit more subtle um, conversation within the feminist, right? Um, so uh, Fumian, you and I also talk about that yesterday. There is a bit of a divide um, within the feminist groups as well. Um, and you know that you're more familiar with that. Um, and, and I'm not sh exactly sure about the situation in Japan. So the, the, there's one question about how can we better understand the internal conflict or division that exists between the different groups of women, not necessarily only feminists, right? Such as single versus married women. And uh, maybe if you can also touch on the what we talked yesterday about the divide between the feminists as well. Do you want to start with this, and we'll pass over to Unosan. Maybe oh, yeah, some. Well, oh, I understand that Feng Yuan is quite active in the, uh, I mean, acti social activism. You have, mm -hmm. you must have experienced uh, many conflicts yeah. and struggles among us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe I should say a difference is uh, always existed. We should uh, expect the difference. And also difference means uh, different people, um, including feminists, women feminists, have uh, different positions or standpoints or priorities. So I think respecting that's the first and also sometimes if we have time, we have opportunities, we can listen to each other. Yeah, I think. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, all of uh, all, I think, if all of us uh, among the families, I think we, uh, the commonality is more fundamental than difference. So that's what mm. I want to say. Mm. Yeah, actually, yeah. this is a quite interesting question because you know, we have had conflicts uh, among us and over different groups uh, from the beginning, all the ways, before and now and uh, forever. <laughs> so we try to make it open. So this kind of you know open discussion, open debate uh, on among feminists just actually made our uh, thought more active and more lively uh, and, uh, and, and also uh, to, 
to help us uh, for development. So uh, in this sense, you know, I'm glad. I'm glad to say that you know that the, we have in the feminism we have no expulsion, no excommunication, no exclusion because we have no authority. So feminism, mm -hmm. feminist is a self-claimed category. Everyone can claim oneself as a feminist. So it's it's quite okay. So difference can promote our development. Great. Thank you, Anasa. I love how you kind of uh, really make everything seems so easy and simple. Well, it's maybe not that easy and simple to practice. So, um, of course, the answer is simple, but the practice is different, difficult. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> but so maybe one last question. Yeah. Maybe one last question around the broader kind of trend about feminism. Um, so um, what, what have you seen as the feminism movement like progressed like in the past few years, uh, maybe in Japan, but also globally, especially we, we just came out of the COVID pandemic, right? Um, does that have an impact on the development of feminism, either in Japan or broadly in Asia? What's your view on that? Well, some people call it the fourth wave of feminism uh, due to the impact of uh, social media. And uh, it helps us uh, to, uh, I mean, the extend and diffuse uh, feminist activism and thoughts uh, to uh, different uh, communities. So in this sense, you know, the uh, social media works, uh, I mean, the uh, in, in, a great deal. So, uh, especially you know the uh, the rise of Me Too movement uh, helps us you know that uh, understanding uh, the what the sexual violence is. So we were successful in making a reform of I mean the uh, civil code and as well as the uh, crime law. Uh, with the uh, in terms of the consent, uh, so uh, we have several uh, outcomes uh, from this. Uh, I mean, influential activism. So I welcome uh, this, you know, the, the diffusion of uh, I mean, or reboot of the feminism among young feminists. You know, we have such a generational difference. You know, I'm over seventy. And uh, so the, the major uh, age of the uh, participant here is about 20s. There's all the way, almost, you know, half a century age difference. But we share our experience, our thought, our ideas, our hope in common. That's a great thing. Yep. We can we can cover that century half a century age difference right. Right. <laughs> very easily. Um, oh, the oldest um, among us. <laughs> almost yes. Yeah. Um, do you have anything to add on that question, Fiona? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay, all right. So maybe let's move on to a couple of questions that's particularly um, more at the personal level to you, Wenosam. Um, there's one question about. Have you ever encountered a time when your personal will did not align with the societal trends? How did you cope with it? I'm sure there were lots of occasions like that. <laughs> Tell us your story. Well, uh, well, I'm deviant of my society. I, I'm, I'm a single woman. I have no interest in marriage and uh, I have no children. So I'm actually, uh, out of standardized woman, <laughs> image of Japanese woman. And I'm active, I'm outspoken. <laughs> I'm very much resistant. So uh, I know I belong to the social minority and uh, ex exceptions. But actually, I do have much colleagues and comrades and friends and allies who can 
I mean, give me a support. So that encouraged me uh, to be uh, what as what I am. So, and I mean, be to be what you are is the most comfortable thing in life. You don't have to disguise yourself as a standardized woman or, I mean, obedient woman or, I mean, stereotypical Japanese women. But the what, I mean, be as what you are is the most comfortable, most important thing in life. So I'm living a happy life. What's wrong with it? I'm happy that you're happy, Wayno-san. Um, so I'd like I hear... to hear, hear that uh, when you have the answer to the same question. Yeah. She, Would you she like must to... be deviant in her society, right? <laughs> Except... I believe so. But yeah. You want to tell us your story as well? Yeah, I think, um, yes. Um, when I was younger, in my early 20s, I encountered this kind of situation. Um, I think, like Willow Sang just mentioned, I think always uh, we can, I can find some people who support me. My teachers, when I was younger in my 20s, my teachers, um, some of my teachers support me, uh, many of my classmates who support me. So I think this support gave me confidence. Another one is I got confidence from uh, how say from the books, uh, the uh, great books I read. Such um, in that days I did not encounter your books, but um, those books similar like your books also give me self confidence. So that helped me to overcome some obstacles. Thank you for referring to the impact of books, actually. Uh, books are a way to meet people who are already passed away. So we can meet, we can encounter uh, the, the respectful people, especially women, uh, even after they died. So we can have a talk with them. So the, the books helps us a great deal. Yeah, um, that actually touches on another uh, question kind of related about books and your inspi inspirations from the previous generation. Are there any specific feminist artists or writers that have inspired you and influenced your work? Oh, good question. I'm ready to answer that question. I have two great women artists. One is Nikki Do Sanfo. I wish I could show you some of her uh, figures, uh, works. You can just check with Google. And uh, the other one is uh, Judy Chicago, known as a feminist artist. Uh, I mean, uh, whose major work, masterpiece, is known as a uh, dinner party with a bunch of, you know, the uh, replica of. I mean, women genital area of the uh, historical women, like uh, Sappho and, uh, uh, I mean, George, uh, and also the uh, Virginia Woolf and others. Great. Thank they you so are much great for sharing. Artists. You, can, you can check. Yeah, we'll, we'll probably put the names uh, on the mm -hmm. chat uh, for those who are not familiar um, so that everyone can Google those names up if you don't know well, them already. I, I can keep it. Judy Chicago and Nikki Do Sanfa. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. Do you have any names to share? Uh, I think also I shared um, with uh, Yolo-san. Judy Chicago mm -hmm. is one of my fam uh, favorite uh, feminist right. artists. And also... O'Keefe, Virginia O'Keefe, mm -hmm. yeah. and also mm -hmm. Fluida from Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and also some earlier feminist artists from China. One is Pan Yuliang. Uh, she went to France, mm -hmm. uh, France or French? Yeah, to France. study in, mm -hmm. yeah. So I think many, yeah, they are really inspiring. Mm 
Yeah, I visited yeah. Frida's museum and her yeah. house uh, last year, which is uh, really oh. exciting um, yeah. and inspiring as well. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you both for, for sharing that. Important. Yeah. Um, so we have an interesting question from a 17-year-old. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Um, and so, Ueno Sao, you mentioned earlier that you're happy and you live by yourself and, you know, everything seems perfect. Now, her question is, how can we reduce feeling of loneliness if we do not get married? Again, I know you wrote a book on it, um, but again, you need to summarize your book in one minute. Um, do we, and it's a question from a 17 year old who's a half century age difference. Do we feel depressed when we get old? Hmm. Well, okay. <laughs> Well, this girl, age 70, is the youngest among us. And uh, I can ask her uh, a simple question. Do you think that, uh, I mean, uh, can marriage save you from the loneliness? Mm -hmm. It's an illusion. Ask any married woman the same question. <laughs> They are still lonely, even with their husbands. <laughs> now, loneliness is the core of the humanhood. And uh, so you can just, you know, the, uh, I mean, keep, uh, I mean, being alone yourself. And But uh, maybe uh, we can make a distinction between loneliness and the solitude. And uh, so marriage cannot save your solitude. So at the same time, you know, that the age doesn't, you know, the <laughs> mean, uh, I mean, uh, any loneliness. I mean, the even, maybe, you know, that the youngsters uh, who cannot get along well with their own community may feel more lonely than older people. And the uh, age can help you for understanding what life is. We can be more tolerant with the life as we get old. Very wise, very wise life wisdom there. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, maybe I can do a self-exposure. Uh, I had a very, very happy marriage. Um, I and my husband was really so mad. But however, uh, in our marriage, I still sometimes I feel I felt lonely because I, I told my husband and also he agreed with. I understand him more than he understand me. So I totally agree with, you know. I think, I think many women would resonate with your answer. Thank you for sharing with us your personal experience as well, Feng Yuan. Mm -hmm. um, so since we're on this kind of agent topic, um, there's another question around the agent. Um, so when also in your presentation, you actually shared about the co-living or collective living mode in Japan. And the question is specific around that. How can the collective living mode of elderly people be further developed? And how can this mode be mo this model be further developed with experiences from environmental conservation and sexual minority group? Mm. And it's a question from Zoe Duan. Okay, shared housing and collective living for older elderly people, especially elderly women who lived uh, for a single life for uh, years uh, can help them. I mean, I mean, taking care of each other. And uh, prior to the uh, implementation of long-term care insurance, uh, in well, for the purpose of mutual help, uh, some older old ladies uh, started their own project of shared housing and also collective living. But uh, think, you know, uh, if you, I mean, you live in such a small community of old ladies, old people, and uh, if you know, consider uh, if you become the last one of this small community, what happened to you? <laughs> That's a disaster. 
<laughs> and uh, so after the implementation of the uh, long-term caretaking law in Japan, I, I thought, you know, oh, gee, this law is for me, people like me as a single woman. So uh, it just helps me, not only me, but also many single women to live alone in their own household and uh, uh, aging in place and dying in place. So it's okay to die alone in your bed, in your house, uh, with no one uh, watching you, but with the support of caregivers, and uh, doctors and nurses and other professionals. We we now can do it. Yep. Thank you very much. And Fran, is there like co-living, is it also emerging in China as well? Actually, I'm not sure. Um, I think we can see a few cases, mm. but uh, actually I think the diversity of the family types mm. uh, ac actually existed. Mm. Well, the issue is the policymakers um, should recognize that existence mm. and to develop more um, family-friendly policy mm. to this diversity of the family types. Right. Mm. Yeah. Maybe just to add an anecdote, I was asking mm. my mom since I'm the only child, right? Mm. So I was asking, and I'm away from her. So I was mm. asking her. So what do you think? Like when you get old, who's going to take care of you if I'm, I'm not around? Mm. And her answer is robot will. <laughs> <laughs> and robot. Oh, like robot. the robot. Yeah. Mm. Yes. And and just to add to on that anecdote, her first encounter with robots is actually in Japan like 10 years ago. So I think we need to develop some robots to really take care of my mom and and mm -hmm. other aging women in China. So yes, um, are you really sorry? serious? Are you serious okay. about a robot taking care of the other people? Um, well, it's half joke, but I already start seeing some developments on that, to mm -hmm. be honest. Um, I start seeing um, I think it's not like mainstreamed, but I start seeing some experiments actually of robots not not actually doing everything, mm -hmm. but you know serving some food and drinks, and that's actually getting popular in first year cities, not necessarily only for elderly care, but also for the general service industry. Mm -hmm. So you never know what happens in ten years with the current development of technology. Mm -hmm. So really interesting to see how things are. But I was surprised by my mom's answer. Like yeah. I was like. Okay, we'd better make some developments on technology. It all, all, almost sounds like a refusal of thinking about the old days. It's 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 actually the stop thinking, and uh, I mean it's quite unrealistic, you know, because simply because you know care is a communication mm. between people between human being. Robot cannot do that. Yeah. Don't worry, I'm not leaving my mom to robots. <laughs> <laughs> you can live away from her. The, that's actually what, you know, our caregiving, caretaking insurance made possible. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So just checking time. Um, I think we have uh, one time for one last question, um, and then we will move on to the concluding conclusion remarks. Um, so I'm just looking for the questions. Yeah, there is an interesting question um, since we didn't touch on that earlier. So I kind of want to bring it up since it's mentioned a lot in the registration as well. So the question is about the debate around whether or not women should wear makeup. And there's different opinions around that, right? My understanding is some people consider that wearing makeup is to really fulfill men's willingness for women to look beautiful. And the other is thinking that's natural rights for women to do so. So there's debate around that. So um, what do you think? Like, um, should women be 
I, I kind of know what you're going to say when I say I'm going to say you be you if you want to wear makeup, <laughs> you wear makeup. Um, but maybe before when I react to that, um, do you want to elaborate a little bit more around the debates around this topic, yeah. just to provide a bit more context on, on the yeah. debate? Yeah, maybe yeah. I will provide some information. Recent years in China, especially in the social media, there are um, some hot debates. One of them is about so-called beauty neighbor, uh, Fu Mei Yi. Uh, it's kind, kind of com uh, compulsory or mandate, mandate the, um, how say, beauty neighbor for women as a, um, how say, um, as a duty to be uh, beautiful. Uh, so uh, there are very divided opinion among uh, different uh, groups of young families. So this is my uh, background I have. Yeah, so when or so, makeup or not? <laughs> <laughs> you see how I make up today? <laughs> yeah, oh, you look great. Yeah. Well, I made just a slight makeup for you and for myself, not for men. <laughs> and uh, well, actually, uh, I, we call it uh, feminist fundamentalism, uh, thinking that the feminists should have no makeups, no brushes, no chemical clothes, <laughs> no high heels. Yeah, but uh, looking back the history of humankind, the people always, you know, that, that decorate themselves. They like, you know, beautiful things and cute things. And so, and, uh, so uh, as I do, I mean, I put this earring today and I have this necklace and I have a slight makeup. So what's wrong with it? So, and uh, we live in the society, and uh, I mean, assuming that the women are burdened with this kind of, you know, ornament and uh, makeup, but uh, men would be interested in that. I mean, they they may want to make up themselves, and uh, it's nothing wrong for both men and women. Thank you. My takeaway is that whether or not you're a man or woman, wear makeup, like if you want to do that, do that. You be you and do that for yourself, not for right. others. Right. Great. Exactly. Thank you so much. All right. We're almost at the end of the hour. Um, so before we close, may I ask both Wen Osan and Fan Yuan to give us some final thoughts, reflections or suggestions for the audience, for the crowd. Um, anything you want to say, like in one or two minutes. So yeah, do you want to go first? Yeah, and we'll let, goes, yeah. yeah. Um, I want to how say, share with our uh, audience today, most um, our women. Um, first of all, uh, we have to um, make more effort collectively. If we don't any, um, if we don't make any uh, efforts, uh, especially collectively, nothing changed, nothing improved. Uh, but if we make efforts, we will make some difference. That's all. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Fan Yuan. Wen Osan? Well, I said it in my last word, in my presentation. I mean, I have expectation to see the growth of Chinese feminism. You need your own way of feminism. So in the near future, we can make an exchange. Right. Give our own feminism and make change in our own ways. Thank right. you so much, Wen Osan. And this is such a fascinating and robust conversation. I think this conversation can go on for another three hours um, if I don't, but we are running out of time. And in the interest of time, my um, hand over back to Professor Ruby Young to close us up. Thank you both. Thank you, Yolanda, being the moderator. And um, this is such a, a very um, sort of engaging and also intellectually interesting 
to discuss about uh, feminism, gender issue on Women's Day. And, um, you know, a takeaway is, of course, we should have dialogue, we should be ourselves, and always, you know, um, do it for what makes us most happy and do the right thing. Um, and also continue to fight for what we deserve. And I think that's my takeaway. And I think that also each region should develop their own feminism or their own voice to you know, fight for their own rights or, or speak out for their, their, what they deserve or what they um, you know, entitle. And uh, that's it. Thank you so much, Ruby. And thank you so much for joining us, Bueno Sun. Yeah, to add one more word, I mean, thank you, Yolanda, Fenyang, and Ruby, and Shawton, and all the audience. Yes, and we also have some other colleagues at the back. You cannot see mm -hmm. them, but mm -hmm. thank you, Ricky, Roy, um, Bonita, and Wendy, and Anthony for supporting this event. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. We hope to see you soon. And that's I can. <laughs> Thank you, Zajian. Thank you, everyone. Happy International Women's Day. Right. Exactly. All right. Ciao, ciao. It is will be in bloom. Bloom.